In the last two centuries since Dalton developed his ideas, scientists have made significant progress in furthering our understanding of atomic theory. So we knew at the time of Dalton, um, or at least there was a lot of evidence and people were really starting to believe it was true, that there were things called atoms and different atoms um, were the smallest pieces of an individual element and they couldn't get any smaller and they would mix together in different proportions to make compounds. Um, so uh, one of the first experiments to show that some of Dalton's postulates were not perfect, were, were, were um, a good step forward but weren't quite right in some ways was that he said that an atom was the smallest particle and it couldn't get any smaller. Well, now this experiment, the cathode ray tube, was suggesting that there was something that was smaller than an atom. And so this is the way the experiment goes. Um, there is a sealed glass vacuum tube and two electrodes on either side of the tube. So there's no gas inside, or at least very little. And when it, uh, a current is applied to the electrodes, then um, it, it will do, you would also have to put some kind of um, fluorescent or phosphorescent paper inside the tube so that you could actually see the beam. But when, when all the conditions were right and you turned on the electricity, you could see a beam of light leaving the, uh, the cathode and arriving at the anode. So um, the it, event, essentially what was being proposed here in this experiment was that um, since there was nothing inside the tube, it was empty of matter, then there shouldn't have been any, nothing should have happened when the electricity was turned on. For something to emit light like that, like they were seeing, they think, well, it has to be some kind of matter but how can that be possible? There, this is a, an evacuated tube, glass tube. There isn't any gas inside. There's nothing inside of it. It's, it's a vacuum. So if there's no matter inside, we shouldn't be able to see this light. So they changed, the, um, they changed some of the metals of the electrodes being used. And even if they used different metals, they would always see the same kind of beam. So it didn't seem like it was coming from the metal, or if it was coming from the metal, it was something that all the metal shared, apparently. So he concluded that whatever these particles were, that they were much lighter than atoms, and that they were negatively charged, um, and they, regardless of which metal he used, they were always exactly the same. So the same thing would come from different metals. So we have we now know that what he had found was the electron a negatively charged particle that makes up the atom and it's a, about 2000 times uh to say subatomic particle with a mass more than 1000 times less than that of an atom an electron is actually 2000 times lighter than uh, a proton so electrons are very very small compared to protons and neutrons Okay, so here's what the cathode ray tube looks like. Let's watch the experiment here. As we turn on the screen, we notice that electrons are emitted from the cathode, and as they strike the fluorescent screen, we're able to see the cathode ray. So there's, there's no matter in this tube, but when they turn the electrodes on, this beam of light seems to come from the cathode. So here's the other thing. They have a magnet here, and the beam seems to react to the magnet. It seems to be repelled by the negative side of the magnet. And if you flip the magnet over, it seems to be attracted to the positive side of the magnet. So when you, when you flip the magnet over now, now it seems to be attracted to the positive side. So this beam was charged, it had a negative charge, that's how they figured out it had a negative charge, um, and it seemed to be the same kind of beam coming from different uh, metals. So now, of course, we know that that 
that the electron, of course, is in all atoms. And so the reason they were seeing the same cathode ray being emitted from different uh, cathodes, as it were, different materials, different uh, made of different metals, is because they were seeing electrodes, or excuse me, electrons. When a large enough voltage is applied to the cathode, they're actually breaking electrons free. The electrons are being pulled, they're being, well, I guess they're being pushed off of the anode, and they're being pulled, pushed off of the cathode and being pulled toward the anode, because the anode is positive. So when you apply a high voltage, you're forcing the electrons off of the metal, which makes that beam. Um, another experiment that um, was important in the discovery of the electrons called Millikan's oil drop experiment. And so um, what happened in this experiment, um, Millikan created microscopic oil droplets, which were electrically charged, and he could speed the drops up or slow them down or reverse them by an electric field because they were electrically charged. So um, he would, since the drops were so small and they were um, getting a charge, he figured that they were only getting a charge maybe of uh, uh, minus one or minus two or minus three. He figured that they were getting a charge that was a, a multiple, a small multiple of a number. So here is his experiment. He's got these. Um, oil in here and it's just kind of like a, a perfume bottle and you, you squeeze the bulb and it kind of sprays a fine mist of oil out and the fine mist of oil can drop down through this plate and when it drops down through the plate there is a beam of shooting x-rays and x-rays are really powerful so if the x-rays hit the atoms that are in a drop of oil then the x-rays will knock the electrons off of that drop of oil and they'll make the drop positively charged because it'll lose electrons. So now these positively charged drops of oil are falling, but there are two plates here. And the um, charge on these plates could be very precisely controlled. And so when he would have positively charged drops falling toward the um, plate here, he could uh, speed up the drops or slow them down by changing the electric charge on the plates and depending on when he would find the drops to reverse or stay still then he would know exactly what charge that drop had on it because he would know what charge was on the plate and they must be the same and these were his results and he found that the drops the charge of the plate when the drops would stay still was always equal to a multiple of 1.6 times 10 to the 19th coulombs. So 1.6, or 3.2, which is just this times 2, or 6.4, which is this times 4, or 4.8, which is this times 3. So he figured that this was the smallest one, and it was always a multiple of this. So this must be the charge of one single electron. So now they knew about the electron, they knew that it had a negative charge, they knew what the value of the negative charge was, and Thomson, earlier with his uh, experiment with the um, cathode ray tube, had determined that the charge to mass ratio would be this number, 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So now that they knew what the charge of an electron was, 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulombs, then they could use that conversion factor that Thompson had discovered earlier um, to calculate the mass of an electron. 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, which is incredibly small, which is about 2,000 times smaller than a proton. So now that people knew that there was a negatively charged particle inside of atoms, they assumed that there must also be a positively charged particle inside of atoms because atoms are neutral. If they have a negative and they're neutral, then they must also have a positive. So here were a couple of ideas for what the atom looked like. 
Nobody knew before this that atoms had pieces, so they didn't have to fill in the insides with pluses and minuses. It was just a brown ball or a purple ball. But now they had to figure out what, where were these charges inside of an atom. Well, one idea was called the plum pudding model, and that's uh, this, this one here, plum pudding. And this is what a plum pudding cake looks like. It's just kind of like a cake with raisins in it. And so the idea was the positive charge is the cake and the raisins were the electrons. So this was maybe like one, this is where the pluses and minuses are in an atom. There's kind of in there like a cake. Somebody else, uh, this, was, this was actually Thompson's suggestion. Uh, Nagaoka proposed that the atom looked more like Saturn so that there was a positive charge in the middle and there was kind of like a ring of electrons that were orbiting around the positive charge. And really, this model is pretty close to what we figured out eventually, that there is a positively charged center and the electrons are orbiting that positively charged center. So this is, this is a pretty good model. Okay, so at that point they didn't they knew that there must be positive charge, but they didn't know that there were protons. They didn't know that there was a nucleus. So Ernest Rutherford uh, conducted an experiment, the gold foil experiment, and here's what his experiment looks like. He had um, a sample of radium in here, and radium is radioactive. So radioactive things shoot out radioactive particles, and they shoot the radioactive particles out in every direction. So if you could put radioactive stuff inside a big case made of solid lead, then the radioactive particles can't get through the lead. So they'd be, they wouldn't get out any of these directions because the sample would be encased in lead. But if you left just a little tunnel in one side of the lead, then you could kind of make like a radiation beam. And so that's what they did. They, they made a, a beam of radioactive particles that would shoot straight out of this block of lead. And once they had a, a beam of radioactive particles, um, Rutherford shot it at a very thin piece of gold foil. So it's like tin foil, but it was made of gold. So when he did this, what he expected was that the, the particles, the radioactive particles called alpha particles, were really big particles and they would just pass right through the foil um, because they're, uh, we, they didn't know what protons were and they didn't know what nuclei were so there was they didn't think there was really anything to slow this down because uh, electrons were too small they knew about electrons but they were too small to slow this particle down but what they saw was that s some of the particles didn't go straight through they kind of bounced off to the side like they got knocked around or something and a couple of the particles would bounce straight backwards toward the detector like this and that was very baffling to Rutherford because he didn't understand. He, he, he figured that this was like a cannonball, and these are his words. He said, this is like a cannonball, and this is like a piece of paper. So how can I shoot a cannonball at a piece of paper and have the cannonball bounce off of the paper? It didn't make any sense to him how this happened. But they, uh, after looking at the results and repeating the experiment a couple of times, he determined that this was what was happening. These big particles were passing, a lot of them would pass right through because the nucleus is really, really small and there's a lot of empty space and electrons and stuff out here and the, the alpha particles could go right through all of that. But if the alpha particle hit a nucleus, this the alpha particle is positive, the nucleus is positive, it bounces off. So. This was the discovery of the nucleus. They found that there was a dense piece of matter right in the middle of every atom that was positively charged and it could kind of deflect these radioactive particles. So now they knew, okay, well now we know there's electrons, negative particles, and we know there's a positive nucleus that's really small and really dense and it's right in the middle of the atom. So it kind of is like the Saturn. It's like, it looks like a plant, it looks like a solar system. The nucleus is the sun. And the electrons are out here, kind of like the planets. So, um, other important discoveries around that same time were that uh, 
isotopes that uh, some other problems with Dalton's theory. Dalton said that all atoms of an element are exactly the same and they have exactly the same mass. Well, that's not necessarily true because there are different versions of elements, uh, different, different kinds of atoms of an element, and those are called isotopes. And the only way that they differ is by their mass. They don't differ in their chemical properties. And generally, when you have a sample of an element from Earth, it's a mixture of isotopes. So uh, they, early scientists didn't realize that those atoms actually were that there were different kinds of atoms inside of a pure sample of an element. But when they did realize that, that, that atoms of the same element that um, might have slightly different masses, they sought to find the particle that would be, um, that would account for that extra mass. Because protons uh, are positive, and it was easy to determine how many protons there were and how many electrons there were because of their charge. But these neutral neutrons were much more difficult to find because uh, the, it was the charge that really helped these other particles to be discovered. But eventually, in 1932, uh, James Chadwick discovered neutrons also. So around this time, 1932, we knew that atoms had uh, a, a nucleus with a positive center, and neutrons were also in the nucleus. And then electrons orbited the nucleus, kind of like planets orbit the sun.